Ciao! Here is a conversation with Marian Gidea. Dr. Gidea is a mathematician focusing on the interplay between topology and dynamical systems theory, with a particular focus on symplectic geometry and Hamiltonian dynamical systems. He is professor of mathematics at Yeshiva University and program director at the National Science Foundation. We start talking about practical applications of his work in celestial mechanics in the context of the Lucy mission. We then get into the geometric properties of Hamiltonian systems, from the foliation of invariant tori in the phase space, coming from the Liouville Arnold theorem, to the KAM theory and the role of resonances for the arising of irregular motion. We discuss Arnold diffusion in celestial mechanics, the stability of the solar system, and the presence of stochastic behavior in celestial mechanics, not necessarily related to the presence of underlying stochastic processes therefore underlying the relation between chaos and stochasticity. We mentioned the fundamental problem of dynamics by Poincaré and his conjecture about the denseness of periodic orbits in the three-body problem. We then move into the use of topological and machine learning techniques to characterize critical transitions in climate and financial systems. We close on the use of the Melnikov method and on the dialogue between the analysis of complex systems and Hamiltonian ones. I hope you enjoy it. To support this project, please subscribe to my YouTube channel connect with me on Twitter and LinkedIn, and support me on Patreon with a monthly membership following the links in the description. Uh, so thank you for joining this conversation. I'd like to start, let's say, from the, from the ground up, so from the practical applications of your work, and then going deep, deeper into the theoretical aspects. And the first thing I'd like to ask you is the, the work you've conducted uh, in, in a joint work with the JPL from NASA, looking into trajectory design uh, because they were interested in looking uh, at trajectories to Jupiter and the Jupiter system. And uh, I don't know, what, what have you been looking into for that? Ballistic capture, environment manifolds? What can you... So, um, actually, uh, this work started, uh, was inspired by one of the NASA's mission, uh, uh, Lucy. So I think Lucy was uh, launched there just very recently. So it's a spacecraft that it's uh, going towards Jupiter and it's supposed to uh, visit some of the Jupiter uh, trojans, some of the asteroids. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, with one of the uh, PhD students at Yeshiva University, Waiting Lamp, who by the way graduated uh, in January, 2021, we focused on uh, one particular uh, asteroid. Um, and um, basically we wanted to, so it's a, uh, we wanted to understand what are uh, the possible uh, trajectories, what is the dynamics in the uh, vicinity right. of, of that uh, asteroid. And, um, what we wanted to, to take into account is the shape of the asteroid. Mm -hmm. So the asteroid is Hector, and it's one of the largest uh, Trojan asteroids, and uh, it has a strange shape. So it's like uh, best approximated by a dumbbell shape. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. And because of that, the gravitational field is uh, somewhat different from that of a, of a, of a spherical shape. And uh, we are wondering what is the influence on the dynamics. So if a spacecraft uh, were to go near such an asteroid, what kind of uh, uh, gravitational vector field we expect? And what kind of orbits are in the vicinity of such mm -hmm. an asteroid? So uh, we did not uh, uh, really consider uh, space mission design as in going from uh, Earth to Jupiter right. to that asteroid, but we want to understand what is the influence of the shape on uh, the dynamics near such an asteroid. Mm -hmm. so, and for this, were you also looking into the, 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 gravitational, the gravitational attraction of the Sun and Jupiter? I mean, what was the model? Uh, so it was a uh, restricted uh, four uh, body problem right. in the sense that. Uh, we consider the motion, the main bodies as Sun, uh, Jupiter, and Hector. Mm -hmm. And so these are three bodies that are like uh, larger masses. And the fourth body of infinitesimal mass would be the spacecraft. Mm -hmm. right. So that was the model that we considered. Um, 
But another motivation for looking at Hector is that Hector has a moon, a tiny moon. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. this was discovered recently. So we can as well think of this moon as the fourth body. Right. And the moon was discovered uh, uh, relatively recently, and the motion of the moon is uh, poorly understood because it's uh, very difficult to observe it. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the questions that is asked is whether the motion of the moon is stable over the long term or not, mm -hmm. because it's close to some resonances and it's quite possible that some uh, instability will lead the motion of the moon to actually escape from Hector. Mm -hmm. So that was a second motivation for, right. for this work. Right. Okay. You, you mentioned resonances. So maybe it's a good place to enter into Hamiltonian mechanics. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe if you could, I don't know how to best introduce it, but maybe uh, starting from the Louis-Viraldo theorem, uh, action angle variables, and then uh, what's the role of resonances there? I don't know, to, to really uh, uh, basic, uh, to a basic uh, level, let's see. Okay, so uh, if uh, you, you don't mind, I'll start with an uh, even more basic level. Yeah, sure, the, 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 the more basic, <laughs> the, the better. So, uh, okay, so, Basically, uh, uh, Hamiltonian systems or Hamiltonian uh, dynamics is concerned in uh, mechanical systems that preserve the energy over the long run. Of course, this is like the simplest setup. And uh, Hamiltonian formalism is to study uh, the dynamics of the system uh, via a translated into uh, first order differential equations. And one thing that is uh, noticed in many such Hamiltonian systems is that they have uh, uh, certain symmetries and these symmetries uh, lead to the appearance of nice geometric objects. So for instance, you can have uh, many periodic orbits or you can have uh, more general orbits like uh, quasi-periodic orbits, so the uh, motions that uh, um, are supported by uh, invariant tori, the donut shapes, mm -hmm. and while they move around this tori, the trajectories do not close onto itself themselves, but they pass arbitrarily close to the starting point and they do this many, many times. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, besides uh, such regular orbits, one can see uh, chaotic orbits, uh, irregular orbits. So one of the fascinating problems is that in typical Hamiltonian systems, you have coexistence of regular motions, of irregular motions. And uh, people uh, starting from the time of Poincaré, they wanted to understand what is the interplay between these two types of dynamics. Mm -hmm. And uh, what you uh, referred to earlier is uh, uh, one of the simplest cases of Hamiltonian systems, integrable Hamiltonian systems. So systems that we can actually solve, let's just say by quadratures. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have a very simple geometry. So I'm a, uh, in my work, I'm really interested in the methods that comes from, come from geometry and topology. So I'm looking at what are the geometric objects that um, dictate, that uh, act like as landmarks of the dynamics. Mm -hmm. And uh, if a system is integrable, then the geometry is very simple. So the whole space is filled by invariant tori, by donuts of some dimension. Mm -hmm. And uh, the motion of each of these tori, it's very regular. So it's essentially a rotation by some uh, frequency. Mm -hmm. So uh, 
Well, there are, uh, may, there are some simple uh, integrable systems that are encountered in, in nature, in physics, like uh, I don't know, penduli or harmonic oscillators or some other type of oscillators like rotators. Uh, but when you start to couple such systems, uh, they start to influence each other. And uh, while the original uh, motion of individual system can be regular, once you start to couple them, when they have uh, influence between the system, the motion uh, may cease to be integrable. And then you have uh, uh, this coexistence of regular motions. Mm -hmm. and irregular motions, chaotic ones. Okay, and these resonances are associated to this chaotic motion. So, yes, so resonances are... Uh, okay, so people try to understand how uh, starting from uh, regular motions, you, you have the birth of irregular ones. Mm -hmm. They happen uh, near these resonances. So... Uh, well, let me say it in a geometric way. So, uh, so imagine that you have a, a torus that, and you have some motion of such a torus. So it can be a, a quasi-periodic motion. So mm -hmm. uh, each trajectory is like uh, moving on the torus, but never goes back to the original point. So you have an orbit that is dense, it fills mm -hmm. up the whole torus. So that is one case. But it's also possible to have that the torus is filled by individual periodic orbits. Mm -hmm. So that would be like a, a resonant torus. Right. So um, the non-resonant ones, the ones that are filled by trajectories that fill out densely the torus are the ones that are surviving a perturbation. So essentially the coupling, so if I start to add take this motion and perturb it by something, like adding another system. Uh, this type of uh, non-resonant motion will survive. So this tori may survive, although being likely deformed. So this is what is the so-called KAM theory, mm -hmm. uh, Kolmogorov, Arnold, Moser. While uh, the resonant tori are the ones that are uh, filled by periodic orbits are uh, typically going to be destroyed and they give rise to uh, chaotic motions. Mm -hmm. Right. And this is also related then, oh, I mean, is this equivalent to saying that to the arising of the Arnold web or is there something, I mean, is there some more assumption to say, to, to arrive at that? Uh, yes, I think you are uh, spot on. So, uh, this, so the geometric structures that are uh, uh, coming out from these resonances is uh, are, uh, somewhat complicated, but uh, they are the ones that drive irregular motions on, mm -hmm. on the long run. So they look like a web, and this web is created by such resonances in some high dimensional space and uh, there are uh, uh, chaotic irregular trajectories that can uh, sort of follow this web. And not only that um, they are irregular, but they can also travel a, a long distance in the phase space. Mm -hmm. They move, they may start maybe close to one of these uh, tori where the motion, it's regular, but in the long uh, run, uh, such motions can uh, move very far from, from, from the original motion. They become completely chaotic and they can fill out a large region of the space. Mm -hmm. And I emphasize that uh, this can be a very, very slow process. Mm -hmm. And uh, are there places in which we are detecting it, like in celestial mechanics? Uh, so 
uh, what I was trying to uh, uh, describe before, inspired by your questions, the so-called general problem of Arnold diffusion. Mm -hmm. So Arnold diffusion says that uh, if you start with an integrable system, a system in which the motion is fairly regular, supported by quasi-periodic uh, motion on tori, and if you apply a uh, small perturbation to this, then uh, not only that you have the coexistence between regular motion and chaotic ones, but moreover, you are going to have some trajectories that are going to travel uh, very far. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's Arnold diffusion in a nutshell. And now you ask me a very interesting question whether uh, this has been observed in uh, celestial mechanics. And uh, the answer is maybe. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm going to refer to some works. So uh, there is a, uh, a work by uh, one of my uh, colleagues at Yeshiva University, Pablo Roldan together with his collaborators, uh, Vadim Kaloshin, uh, Marcel Guardia and Jacques Fejols, they look at the uh, main asteroid belt. Mm -hmm. So these are the asteroids between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. And uh, uh, when uh, astronomers look at the main asteroid belt, they observe that there are some gaps in the geometry of this uh, belt of asteroids, so these are the Kirkwood gaps, and they happen at certain resonances corresponding uh, to the relative motion of these asteroids uh, uh, in terms uh, in, uh, uh, with respect to the orbit of Jupiter. And so basically you have a belt, but a ring of asteroids, and but there are some regions where there are no asteroids. And they try to use uh, this Arnold diffusion to explain why uh, asteroids ha happen not to be there in those particular places. And they use uh, uh, this uh, 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 geometrical arguments that I sort of mentioned mm -hmm. before that. If an asteroid happens to be at a resonance, uh, the motion is likely to become irregular, and the asteroid is going to be pushed away from that region and it's going to move to a different region. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is like a possible explanation for these Kirkwood gaps based on a simple model, mm -hmm. but of course, that people in, in astrodynamics, that they look at the formation of the solar system and many, many other effects they, that come into play. Mm -hmm. So uh, while the Arnold diffusion is a possible explanation of this, it's uh, not so easy to argue that this is the only mechanism that uh, we could, uh, Right. So they can be competed me competing mechanisms, and uh, all of them they contribute to the creation of uh, mm -hmm. the Kirkwood gaps. Right. And could something be said uh, thinking about the same topological ideas? I mean, Hamiltonian dynamics ideas about the stability of the solar system itself. Uh, I've been reading some works by Jacques Lascar, uh, looking into basically stating that the, the solar system is not. Uh, it's not regular, but it's chaotic, and it, it quantifies a certain uh, Lyapunov uh, function, Lyapunovian indicator, to, to characterize the, the the time it will take for the solar system to start being irregular. Uh, is is it is this related to what you were saying now? Um, yes. Yeah, so I think um, so. Uh, Jacques Lascar is uh, famous for uh, um, a long-term numerical simulation of the solar system, and uh, his uh, uh, experiments are uh, very well thought, and uh, they rely on deep mathematics. And 
he observed that in the long run, one has stability. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the, the mechanism of instability are the ones that uh, are similar to Arnold diffusion, but at the end of the day, they are, they are much more complex uh, because uh, while Arnold diffusion is concerned particularly with system close to integrable, mm -hmm. then uh, the solar system uh, is sort of difficult to approximate with, with an integrable system, or maybe the approximation mm -hmm. is, is not so great. And uh, then it's, uh, I think Rascar himself doesn't want to associate the Arnold diffusion mechanism mm -hmm. with, uh, okay. with uh, what he observed, but of course there are similarities. Right. Uh, on the other hand, there are also works by, uh, theoretical works by Jacques Pejot who followed up on the old problem of Arnold and he said that the solar system is stable in the KM sense. Okay. What does it mean that you have uh, some initial conditions for which you have uh, KM type of stability? So if you happen to have the initial condition in some particular uh, places, then you are going to have uh, long-term stability. Okay. But uh, this is the theoretical result. So the solar system is not the solar system that we know, but the simplified solar system, mm -hmm. some uh, simplified assumption, for instance, on the masses of the, of the planets. And also uh, that you don't really have, you cannot start with realistic assumption on the initial conditions, mm -hmm. but you start with a very special Mm -hmm. uh, initial condition that make the theory of life. I think it's wonderful that uh, there are theoretical results in one place and uh, very serious uh, uh, numerical results mm -hmm. at the, the other end of the right. spectrum. But uh, somewhere in between, there is mm. a, a gap. Right. So it's an open question. I mean, <laughs> It's another question. Let's say so. Uh, uh, we, in a work with uh, one of my collaborators, uh, Maciej Kapinski, mm -hmm. yes. from, from Krakow, we made an attempt to uh, cover this gap between, uh, let's say, uh, theoretical results that are very restrictive in terms of but mass parameters you should assume, but initial conditions you are allowed to choose and uh, a more uh, realistic system. So we uh, chose a particular system, Neptune Triton. Mm -hmm. uh, Triton has a, a highest eccentricity of an orbit in the solar system. So it, Triton is a a moon of uh, Neptune, but it has very large eccentricity. So uh, we studied uh, what is the possible effect on some uh, infinitesimal object, like a, let's just say you take another asteroid that uh, moves under the influence of uh, Neptune and Triton, and we wanted to see what is the effect of the Arnold diffusion. So we consider realistic parameters and uh, we use theoretical and computer assisted tools to uh, investigate the Arnold diffusion problem. Mm -hmm. And we proved Arnold diffusion for such system. And we also had some estimates of what would be the effects on such an asteroid. And the effects are, uh, uh, let's just say, quite visible. But yeah, you were saying about the idea of using, uh, uh, considering the eccentricity. 
Yes, so, uh, so I was saying that uh, we looked at uh, the Neptune Triton system, and uh, Triton is uh, a moon of uh, Neptune, and it has a very large eccentricity. And we uh, looked at what would be the long term effect of the eccentricity of Triton on a third object, for instance, a small asteroid that is in the vicinity of these two. And um, we did a computer assisted proof to show that you have Arnold diffusion and it's actually uh, uh, the time scale of Arnold diffusion is not so long. So uh, mm -hmm. the effects are, uh, what you say, can be observed for such a system. Right. But of course, this is a simplified system because uh, we sort of neglect the yeah, the sun and the other planets. So we only looked at Neptune, Triton, and a, and a small asteroid. Mm -hmm. And the idea of the, the Arnold diffusion in Kirkwood gaps is different because there your I mean, uh, that phenomena, phenomenon can arise also because even if the eccentricity of Jupiter is zero, while here you, you're dealing with a different dynamical system. Uh, I think no, they, they also consider uh, the effect of the eccentricity of Jupiter, okay. as far as I remember. Okay. Right. And uh, so uh, everything we set up tonight is in, the, in a deterministic framework, right? Um, uh, yes. Do you think it makes sense to introduce stochastic, because I mean, the title of the paper you mentioned is stochastic behavior. Uh, you, you say this to characterize the motion of the asteroid, let's say, of the particle, or because there's some underlying stochasticity in the system? Uh, so, what, what we wanted to, uh, the question that we wanted to address is like, what would be the typical motion of, uh, of such an asteroid? So, so Arnold diffusion is, there exist some initial conditions that make the uh, small body, the asteroid, travel a large distance. But uh, these motions uh, are not uh, tip necessarily typical. And in fact, they can be mm -hmm. very special. So they happen to a uh, tiny, tiny set of initial conditions. So we sort of wanted to ask uh, what happens with the uh, uh, typical initial condition. So uh, the trajectory is going to, is likely going to follow something like a stochastic process. Mm -hmm. We wanted to describe what is the stochastic process that uh, a typical orbit will uh, undergo through. So that's why we had this uh, stochastic process in the title of the paper. So, uh, what we observed is that uh, at least, I mean, what we show is you have some set of initial conditions for which the uh, trajectory will uh, behave like a Brownian motion with a drift. Mm -hmm. So the motion, it's uh, uh, the system, it's purely deterministic, but uh, the typical motion for typical initial condition looks like a Brownian motion over the long run. Mm -hmm. Right, which is, I mean, I've been looking a lot into this uh, somewhat, I mean, the, the similarities between chaotic motion and stochastic processes that one can view. I mean, for example, the fact that the, the spectrum of a chaotic dynamical system is continuous. So basically you cannot distinguish a stochastic process from one reality, one realization of stochastic process from uh, a chaotic uh, behavior and so basically you're saying this and it's different from saying that the underlying dynamics is chaotic itself right um i think it's uh, very similar to, to to what you just said mm -hmm. so uh, the chaotic motion uh, is, is very similar to, to uh, the random motion this is what we were able to figure out 
capture it through mm. these computer assisted methods. Um, and indeed, it's, we looked at statistical tools to look at uh, the distribution of, uh, of the orbit over the uh, long time and how this distribution evolved. So. Interesting. Okay. And can we go back? I mean, not back, we're always talking about the same ideas, but uh, before you mentioned the, the foliation of uh, tori, I mean, the, the fact that uh, in well behaving systems you have this. Uh, this denseness of, ob of geometric objects, or also you said that something related to ergodic theory, I think, that the, the orbits are covering all the torus, uh, something like that. Uh, I've been looking into, recently I discovered this Poincare conjecture, which is not the one from the millennium problems about the, I don't know, I think it's related to topology as well, but it's one about basically in the restricted three body problem. I don't know if you're aware of it. I, I guess so. So tell me. So. Yeah, it's um, so uh, Poincare stated that if a particular solution of the restricted problem, the three body is given, one can always find a periodic solution such that the difference between these two solutions in a small is as small as desired for any given length of time. So basically the, the denseness of periodic solutions in the three body problem. Yes, so um, I think you are uh, absolutely correct. Uh, this is uh, a uh, very challenging question. So I, uh, as far as I know, uh, there is uh, a lot of, uh, let's say, effort trying to uh, answer this question in some context or another, but I think it's a long way to go, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, can topological tools be helpful? I mean, is your work in some way aiming at that direction? Uh, personally, I, I don't see much hope. I mean, topological tools are, the way I use these topological tools are, uh, uh, let's say, good to find a periodic orbit at a time, but, uh, mm -hmm. and, you have maybe not so much control of the orbit, you find this orbit with some error, but to prove that every trajectory can be approximated by a periodic orbit, I think this will require a quantum leap in our mathematical methodologies. So, uh, uh, what do you mean by, ah, okay, uh, uh, this continuity. So enough. developing uh, new theories, for okay. instance. Okay. Or, uh, not that we should use quantum formalism. No, 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 no. Okay. I think uh, it's in quantum leap in our uh, yes. progress. Yes. Right. Okay. And in this, uh, is this also related to the fundamental problem of dynamics? I think Poincaré is it's himself stated this. Uh, so uh, I think uh, the fundamental problem of dynamics formulated by, by Poincaré, the way I understand it, is that uh, we start with an integrable. Newtonian system, a system for which the motion is uh, uh, very regular and uh, add a small perturbation, add a small effect. And uh, the general question is to understand what happens, what kind of possible uh, motions. Okay. Are, uh, so, so it's, it's everything good. I mean, the yes. KM theory yeah. is inside all this framework. Yeah, KM theory is inside, Arnold diffusion is inside. But I think he wanted to, he was wondering what is, let's say, the general behavior. So, what are the possible scenarios? Right. I think we are just scratching the surface. Mm -hmm. That is a very big question. Nice. Nice. Okay, before we close, I'd like to move to another interesting topic. I mean, uh, it's really funny to see someone interested in celestial mechanics and fi finance. <laughs> uh, I, I think it's a nice combination. I mean, I, I really see a lot of parallels. I, I, I enjoy reading both things. Uh, and and I, I knew you from celestial mechanics. And then by looking at, uh, I don't know, the techniques for yeah, uh, understanding financial uh, behaviors. 
I, I, your name popped up again, and I said, "Wow, okay." <laughs> so, so I'm not crazy to think there are parallel between the two fields. Um, so, yeah, you, you use topological uh, techniques to characterize the evolution, to, to basically predict some quant qualitative behavior of financial systems. Uh, are these related to what we have discussed up to now, or if not, uh, what what are they about? So uh, I would say that uh, there is some relation, not, uh, uh, so not directly with celestial mechanics, but with uh, stability and instability in dynamical systems. So I think when, uh, before I start to look at the financial time series, uh, I was interested in uh, deterministic system that undergo bifurcations mm -hmm. and uh, what happens if you add noise to these deterministic systems. And uh, then it, it's sort of difficult to rigorously define what means uh, uh, bifurcation in a noisy system. But uh, the question that you can ask is, People use the terminology of a tipping point or a critical transition when uh, the change, the state of the system makes an abrupt change, a mm -hmm. sudden change. It's unexpected and it's very dramatic. So uh, some of these original questions were uh, posed in the context of climate change. So mm -hmm. the concern is whether the climate will uh, the climate change will eventually lead to a, a change in the temperature and weather that it's very dramatic and it's very hard to revert back even if you start to take uh, measures at the global scale. But that was the initial motivation. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, if you just uh, frame it into a mathematical context, so you have a regular motion and maybe around an attractor mm -hmm. and uh, the motion becomes uh, closer and closer to instability and you add noise and the noise, the effect of the noise is that uh, you, the instability becomes more prominent. So the system is more likely to jump to a different state even before the theoretical uh, mm -hmm value given by the bifurcation. So in fact, uh, uh, I'm currently looking right now at this type of model with uh, a colleague of mine, Pablo Roldan, and also with a student, Elishiva Siegfried. So to sort of uh, find a, a theoretical framework for what is called early warning signs. So people want to see, okay, can you detect these critical transitions before they actually happen from the data. Mm -hmm. So this is where uh, topological data analysis comes into play. So instead of, so you don't know the model, the model is in a black box and you only see the output of the system, which is some time series. So whether it's temperature or carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, or if you look at the financial system, whether it's stock price or index prices and so on. So you look at the time series and you want to see uh, whether there is a uh, change in uh, distribution of the values that is uh, a predictor for a, a bifurcation of a, a critical transition. So uh, the idea is that um, you can uh, perhaps uh, describe uh, this time series as a point cloud in some uh, high dimensional uh, space. So just a bunch of points in some high dimensional space. And of course you can say, uh, why not use statistical methods? Statistical methods are a good candidate to, to find uh, 
changes in the distribution of the point clouds, but we choose to uh, use topological tools. So we want to associate to such point clouds some topological invariants that come from algebraic topology. And the idea is before a critical transition, we start to see that these point clouds are changing their shape. So uh, how do they change the shape? So I think it's a little bit difficult to explain. So they, they are very complex, these point clouds. So you, you are essentially looking for gaps in these point mm -hmm. clouds. And uh, how do these gaps appear? So they can appear in different ways. So maybe the underlying distribution changes. So for instance, you move from a unimodal distribution to a multi-modal distribution. So then uh, the uh, points in the point are more concentrated in some places and less concentrated in some other places. So that's how you have some gaps in the data. Or is the uh, variance of the point clouds that changes? So that means in the periphery of these point clouds, you start to have more holes in the data. So there are several mechanisms that can uh, lead to changes in the shape of the point cloud. And using topological methods, you can actually measure uh, these changes. And uh, we apply this to uh, financial uh, crisis to, with my collaborators, Yuri Katz from Standard & Poor's and later on with uh, Yuri Katz and uh, Pablo Rodan, whom I mentioned before, and with some uh, graduate students, uh, Daniel Goldsmith and uh, Jonas Schmelo. So we looked at uh, first at uh, the uh, financial crashes from year 2000, the dot-com, and mm -hmm. uh, 2008, the uh, housing bubble. And we were able to detect such changes in the financial data. And later on, uh, we looked at uh, the cryptocurrency crash. Mm -hmm. When was it? 2018, mm -hmm. uh, the Bitcoin market crash. And we were able to, to find that, uh, well, there are early signs of such critical transitions. Right. So uh, to go back to your question, so it's still the question, the interplay between stability and instability, between regular motion and irregular motion in dynamical system. But this time the noise is not an outcome of the system, but it's part of the input. So financial time series or uh, data that comes from climate are very noisy intrinsically. Mm -hmm. And we use these topological tools to sort of get a uh, overall picture of, of the data set and how is it changing over time. Mm -hmm. Nice. Nice. And do you think these uh, techniques can be applied back to, to the climate, for example? Because, uh, I mean, also, let me say that this is sounds really related to uh, complex systems theory, the, 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 the topics that won the physics Nobel Prize this year. Um, and, uh, yeah, because, for example, I was looking into a paper by Giorgio Parisi and others, um, looking into... Um, climate and uh, the present of run uh, the effect of random perturbations that gave rise to stochastic resonances in which you jump i guess this that's the same idea critical transition is the same if, i mean is it a synonym yes that is very correct and actually we do have a paper so the paper is not very popular but uh, it's there so uh, it's um specifically on applying these topological data analysis methods, plus the machine learning tools mm -hmm. to study climate data. Right. So we used real data from uh, ice cores to, uh, so it was like 
data from the very distant past mm -hmm. to see whether you can uh, use these tools that I mentioned before as uh, early predictors of, uh, of climate change. Mm -hmm. and, uh, ah, okay, so you applied specifically climate change. Yes, I mean, not for the future climate. Not, we didn't <laughs> yes. try to make predictions what will happen with the future, but we looked at uh, the past as a, let's say, as a learning tool. Okay. And, and do you uh, think then something can go back, let's say, to to more simple systems like this lesson mechanics one? Some some of these ideas can then inform back, uh, I don't know, this, the space community about... I don't know, it sounds a lot like the, the passage from uh, to the geometric viewpoint of Poincaré to characterize qualitatively the motion. And then there's a, an additional jump to uh, an even more qualitative description. Do you think this then can be applied to? Um, I think uh, uh, there is hope. So, uh, mm -hmm. so let me try to address a possible simpler question. So when you consider a, a relatively simple system like from celestial mechanics and add perturbations, so the perturbations can be very general, uh, but for instance, they can be quasi-periodic perturbations. So quasi-periodic perturbation means that uh, to your original system, you add the perturbations that have many independent frequencies, like a trigonometric type of perturbation. Mm -hmm. But the different turns in the perturbation have uh, different uh, frequencies that are incommensurable. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a technique that uh, I've been studying with uh, some of my collaborators, for instance, with Rafael de Sanz. Um, uh, no, Amadeo del Sams, Rafael de la Llave, Teresa, Pablo Roldan. And uh, I think we have a, a pretty solid foundation to understand the effect of such perturbations. Uh, I'm also working with a student now, uh, Samuel Akimbade, of studying such perturbations that are not necessarily conservative, but we allow dissipation into the system. Okay. And what I wanted to say, so I sort of gave you maybe too much information. So quasi-periodic perturbation, if you put many frequencies, they are also very similar to random perturbations. Uh -huh. So when uh, uh, sometimes when people want to st study the effect of random perturbations, if, you, if they want to start with a simpler problem, they say, OK, let's consider a quasi-periodic perturbation in which you have, for some reason, four different frequencies. So okay. apparently, four is a magic number that gives you, uh, that mimics random perturbations. So I don't think we are yet at uh, uh, the level of uh, uh, giving a, a definitive answer to the effect of random perturbations, but we understand very well when a periodic perturbation with many frequencies. Mm -hmm. Let me, if I can mention a collaborator from Italy, mm -hmm. it's Anna Maria Cerubini. So we are working on a project of studying precisely the effect of random perturbations, but not on celestial mechanics in simpler mechanical systems like uh, uh, rotators and penduli mm -hmm. coupled plus small perturbations added, small random perturbations added in the system. Right. Interesting. And um, I saw you have a number of works on the, the application of the Melnikov method, Melnikov theory. Uh, is this used in, in this context or Yes, we, we use it in this context. So, uh, uh, so going back to the first question that you asked about uh, how regular motions uh, lead to 
irregular motions and once you add the perturbation. So one of the standard recipes to uh, obtain chaos is to have like uh, stable and unstable manifolds that start to intersect transversely. So what happens is that uh, maybe we have a simpler system in which we have stable and unstable manifolds of I don't know, periodic orbit, uh, a torus of a quasi periodic orbit that they coincide, they do not intersect transversely, which doesn't give you chaos. But then you say, now I'm going to add the perturbation. Maybe this perturbation will help me to find these geometric structures, like stable and stable manifold that have transverse intersection. Once you have transverse intersection, you have like a Smales horseshoe and we have chaos. So Mernikov theory is one of these tools that allows you to start with the unperturbed system where you do not have the horseshoe, but you have some ingredients and then conclude based on computations on explicit computation, whether the effect of the perturbation will lead to Smales horseshoe. Mm -hmm. Therefore, to chaos. Right. So it's a very practical tool, mm -hmm. has been used for a long time. I've been also using it with my collaborators, including with, uh, my student Samuel Akimbade, with uh, Anna Maria Cerubini, who is a uh, professor at the University of Salento. Mm -hmm. Interesting. That's the, uh, how these things come together, mm -hmm. at least yeah. in my work. So. Yes, yes. No, I think, I mean, at least I, I see a, a nice picture, uh, an organic picture. Uh, now it's clear to me why the interest for finance and celestial mechanics and, I mean, Hamiltonian dynamical systems. So I hope that was clear to, to all the listeners. And I think we can close it here. So I thank you a lot for your availability today and, the, and for your work. I mean, it's amazing to see. Well, so thank you very insights much. in one person so thank uh, you very much thank you for your interest and thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts <laughs>